Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the last talk of this excellent conference. And uh, I hope you had all had a very good experience in the conference and you learned a lot of great things about functional programming. So uh, let's start it. My, myself, uh, Tamil Vendan. I work with a, a startup called Ajira as a lead consultant. So I would like to begin this talk uh, by referring uh, one of the great tweet around functional programming by Michael Feathers. He says, you know, uh, in object-oriented programming, like we encapsulate this mutating state. That's what he mentioning as encapsulating moving parts. Whereas in functional programming, what we do, we minimize state mutation. And this pretty much summarizes the talk I'm going to give. So uh, we are going to see how the state management that we typically do uh, in our application has an impact on our architecture. So uh, it has a, whenever we think of state, we always think in terms of storing the state in database and getting the state from the database. Is there any other alternative perspective? Instead of mutating the state again and again in the database, can we see that from a different perspective and come out with a different paradigm? That's what we are going to explore in this talk. So uh, throughout this example uh, talk, I'm going to give you uh, a walkthrough of an implementation which uh, going to close to real world. I'm going, it's a minimalistic uh, web application which has the typical state management of uh, 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 architecture that we do in a real world application. So uh, this app actually uh, called F Shop Cafe app. Let me show. So F-Shop Cafe app, uh, as the name indicates, it's been implemented using F-Shop. So uh, this Cafe app uh, is a service which is running on a cafe, which helps you to, you know, uh, uh, um, operations of a particular cafe in much better way. So as a visitor visits a cafe, he's going to select the table which is available. So let us assume that I'm taking the table one. So now I visited that cafe and took the first table. Now it is actually waiting for the order. And uh, then the table, now the waiter comes to the, you know, the table and takes the order. I'm ordering a salad and a pizza and a Coke. I place the order. So if I go back to the home, like the table says it is in service. That means the order has been taken. It is actually uh, in service mode. Um, as in a typical cafe, the food that you ordered has to be prepared first before it has to be served. So under chef, you can find all the food items that has, the chef has to prepare. And uh, the waiter will be having a list of items that he has to serve. So the waiter now served the cook, so it is no longer available. By the time the chef has prepared salad, as well as pizza, so he's marking as prepared. Now, these two items are available for, you know, servicing. So uh, the waiter servicing the pizza as well as the salad. Now, after some time, the visitor completed everything. So now he comes to the cashier, where the cashier see the total amount is based on the amount of, uh, you know, food that he had. And uh, after the amount got paid, he just mark it as paid. So you see that the table is again available. So this is the workflow that we are going to see throughout this talk. And uh, so uh, before we see how this can be designed from a functional programming perspective, let's see how we design in the typical normal, uh, no imperative data modeling. Uh, 
for the simplicity, I'm picking a no SQL store here. It can be any database backend. So uh, there will be, for this particular view alone, like the table goes through different transition. And for each transition, what we'll be having, typically in the backend database, we will be having something called a, a document called a table, and it will be having an ID as well as the status associate. Whenever you know some, the user performs some action, we go and change the status. Right? This is how we typically develop the application. Well, there is no, nothing wrong with that design, and that's how we develop a lot of systems. But what I'm going to propose here is an alternative. So in order to see that particular, uh, you know, uh, come out with an alternative, we need to see the same problem with a different pair of eyes. What I say is a different perspective altogether. So let me introduce a new variable into our application called time, which we often forget when we are designing the application. So at the instant, say t0, the state of the application is idle. So after some time, say t1, when the visitor has opened the particular table by take, clicking the button, the system receives a command called open tab. And after some time, the system receives an another command called place order. That means the order has been collected from the user. Likewise, on different instance of time, the system is receiving different commands from the user. And accordingly, at different instance of time, we are mutating the, the backend value. This summarizes that the state that we are persisting in a database is actually transient in nature. But we are actually hiding this concept when we are designing the database. For example, say uh, uh, you are defining a, a, a profile table, you know, a name and his company. And obviously, we switch companies. So for example, uh, say uh, you moved from company X to company Y. Initially, the table will have company as X. After you move, the company will be, say, Y. But this particular information, if after some time, if, I, if I come and ask you, what are all your past employers, the, the database that we design cannot answer that question, because the X is no longer there, because that's been mutated with Y. So instead of you know, mutating this value, let's embrace this concept that state is transient in nature. So let's use a term called tab, which you know, tracks the user workflow in the cafe. So initially, the system is in the state called closed tab. After receiving the command open tab, it moves to the next state called open tab. And there it receives an another command called place order, which is order has been placed. It moves to the next state where the order has been placed. It's a placed order state. There it receives commands like serve drink, means the food he has, the drink he has ordered has been served. So he's receiving a command called serve drink. And in case if the order contains food, it will be prepared. So he can, during that state, uh, the system can receive prepare food command also. Likewise, once the drink has been served, there are a few more items to serve. That means the state of the current system is the order is in progress. And when the order is in progress, the subsequent you know, food and drinks will be served or prepared. And finally, once everything is done, the state will be served order state. And there, like after it receives the closed tab, which means the amount has been paid and the cache has collected the code, it again moves back to the initial state called closed tab. So this is what we typically call it as state transition diagram. This is com something like a more decorated state transition diagram, but it is exactly what we do in a state transition diagram. So there is nothing fancy out here, but if we generalize this particular state transition, what we get is state x, upon receiving a command, it moves to state y. Okay, that gives nothing but a function. Let's define this function as evolve. Evolve is a function that takes a state and a comment and moves to a new state. Okay, 
command is something which is coming from the user okay but where does the state coming from typically we will be fetching the state from the database before calling this function but what we are going to do here is we are going to derive from where the state is coming from that's what like like a mathematical theorem we are going to find out what is state okay so to derive state we need an another data say we we start with the initial state and after receiving some command it moves to a different state uh in a typical uh way of dev, uh, you know doing this transition the outside world we will be uh, mutating the state but here what i'm telling is don't mutate the state then if you are not mutating the state how does the outside world know that this particular thing has happened in the system yes that's where we are going to introduce a new term called events events are nothing but the the there is the fact that happened on the system so when this particular transition happens the system is going to emit an event called the tab has been opened so let's model this as a function so we have a function called execute it takes a state and a comment and it comes out with the list of events associated with the state transition say so here what we are seeing is the initially the the system of the the state of the system is in closed tab upon receiving command it has moved to open tab that means the tab has been opened in the system so we are just emitting that event so if we apply the same events on all the state transition we will be getting different events say for example uh, when an order has been placed we will getting an we will emit an event called order placed this event has its all its associated data with itself say for example if the order is been placed it will contain all the data something like uh, what are all the food items has been ordered what are all the drinks has been ordered to which table this particular order belongs to all this associated information of an event is been there inside the event so now we have the events of the entire system can we derive something out of it events as i said earlier events are nothing but facts that happened on the system so let's embrace it and introduce a new function called apply to give an analogy let's take an example of your bank account let's assume that you are having say 1000 dollar in your bank account and you are getting an event say as an sms 50 dollar got credited then what will be your balance right now 1050 dollar you are actually what you are doing is you are coming out with a new state the earlier state it is $1000 now you received a event say it is credit and $50 then what you do it's you translate that fact into credit means plus so you are adding that plus into that 50 so you are coming out with a new state called $150 in case if it is a sms for debit you will be the new state will be $950 so this is what we are going to do here we are going to take a state and a event we are going to apply the event to the state and obviously we will be coming out with a new state fine now we know two things the outside world can know about the state transition by means of events so instead of saving the state what we are going to do we are going to save the events so when, when even we are going to save the events in the order it actually emitted from the system it's a append only data store much like you can think of a transaction lag happening in your system so we started with the initial state we know the initial state is the closed tab and now we have the list of events happened in the system and we have a function called apply which takes a state and a event we will come out with a new state now what we are going to do we are going to take these two things and we are going to fold it in such a way that we are going to arrive at the what will be the last state after the tab closed event this is the at the last which is the last event of the event log so i am going to use the same apply function for the first input closed tab i am going to apply the first oops i am going to apply the first event and i am coming out with the new state likewise i am going to fetch sequentially all the events going to apply the next state it's something like 
the output of this one is be the input of this one. Likewise, it's nice like we are applying the fold operations here, and we arrive at the, the final state. And we can summarize this as the operation called compute state. A function is a compute state, takes the initial state, which we know it is closed, and the past events, which we can fetch from the database, and we can apply the fold operation. What we will be getting is the, the state that we want. This is what we wanted. So we started with this. And now we have these three functions, which we derived. So with these three functions in place, we can rewrite the evolve function, which we were, where I asked, we got the command from the user, but the state that we need to compute from somewhere else. That, that we are having, already having a set of functions which will replace the state, which is as a set of past events. So what we are going to do here, instead of state, we are going to use past events, which anyhow we will be getting that from the data store. So we are going to get the past events and going to call the compute state function where we will be getting a new state, and we will be executing the incoming command against this state with the execute function. As an output, we will be getting a list of, again, another events. So far, we are not mutating any state at all. Everything, like this is a pure function, this is a pure function, this is a pure function. Every function is just been operating on the input. That's what the tweet mentioned. Like, we are functional programming minimize the moving parts. We, are, we minimized all the moving parts here. So we started with this, and we evolved to this one. This is actually called event system, coined by uh, Greg Young, where the current state is nothing but the, f the, the fold of past events happened in the system. This is called event source. That's fine. Now we have the evolve function. But that the, we, in order to make it really useful, we need to you know expose this as an API, right? So in order to expose this as an API, um, the, as a, the command is coming from the user. In order to fetch the existing events, we need to have some database access. So let me define two more functions. Uh, get table ID, it takes a command, and uh, from the command, it takes the table ID. And get past events is a impure function. I'm going to call that function by giving the table ID, it is going to give, fetch me, you know, the set of events happened on the given table. Sorry, it's very fast. Okay, cool. Ah. Now, I'm going to define a new function called handle command that takes a command and get the table ID from the command. And the pipeline is just the Unix pipeline. I'm going to pass that to this get past events function. Now I will be having all the events past events, then I call the evolve function with the past events and the command. To make it simple, I'm not uh, no, talking about error handling here. I will be touching upon in the later slides. Cool. Now we have handle command function. To expose this as an API, again, we are going to create another function. That function is going to take an HTTP request and return a HTTP response. So we are going to get the command from the HTTP request by doing some JSON deserialization, and we are going to get the command. Once we got the command, we're going to call the handle command method, sorry, function, and we will be getting a new events, and we, are, we, are, we will be saving the new events, and then return OK response. Now, we started with some function, and we, are, we molded it by you know, uh, re refactoring the state with the past events. Now, we reached a point where it is being exposed as a API. So far, we are seeing the one side of the coin. That means the command sides of an application. There is another side of an application. What is it? Exactly, queries. So in order to view all this information in the UI, we need something called queries. In other ways, we call it as reads. Commands are treating the writes of an operation. Reads, uh, queries are nothing but the reads of the system. Before going to see from the functional perspective, let's see how we do this in a imperative data modeling. Again, I'm going back to the same document example that I had. So 
we mutate this particular uh, state when en whenever any command is being received by the state application, and we fetch the state when there is any queries. Okay. Let's apply the single responsibility principle here. Let's separate command and queries. Before separation, let's see uh, you know, what are all the problems that we had when we model a single uh, data model for both write as well as read. Say, for example, if we denormalize, we all know read will be much efficient. When we denormalize, write will be slow. And again, there is something called impedance mismatch. We may need, uh, say, only two, but we store four because the comments requires four. So likewise, because of we are constraining to use a single model for both read and write, we make a lot of compromise. By separating these two out, our architecture is scalable. We are going to see in the next slide how it is scalable. And before I going on, just this particular concept is called command query responsibility separation. We call it as CQRS. Okay? This is often go in hand in hand with event sourcing, but it is a separate concept altogether. So, what is the benefit that we are getting out of this by separating comments and queries? We saw an example like where whenever there is any state transition happen, events are getting emitted. So what we're going to do, we are going to publish this event to a message queue. Okay, let it be RabbitMQ or ZeroQ or Kafka, end service bus, whatever message queue you are talking about. Okay, so you are just publishing that event to the message queue. Now, we are going to listen to the message queue by a client called read model projection client. This particular component is only responsibility is it's going to listen to the events and populate its own data store. And from this data store, we are going to create an API server and we'll be serving the data to the user. This is the first thing that we will be doing. In the beforehand, we will be doing the single thing like both write and read on a single data store. Now we totally decoupled the pieces. There is nothing fancy here, it solves the same problem. But the most beautiful thing about this kind way of design is, let's say that you have rolled out this particular version. Now the client is happy and uh, the software is doing very well. And all of a sudden, uh, the client is coming back to you and asking, hey, uh, every now and then I am pulling the data to see the result. Why don't you push some, the result in a real time? What you need to do? Very simple. Just write an another client. Let me call it as WebSocket client, which will again listen to the message queue and publish the result and push the results to the UI. Cool. And it goes. You saw the now the client is happy, and you are also happy. The system is going live. After some time, uh, the computation has increased. So, what you need is a some sort of analytics, some sort of uh, you know data science into it, so that you can call you know the brand new application or something like that. So you need to introduce data science into it. What all you need to do is just listen and write an another client, which will listen again to the events, and it is going to populate its own database. Say for example, the database that you are using for your real application may not be a good fit for the data science or data data analytics that you want to run. Say for example, you want to use Cassandra or maybe even some other system. All you need is just use those database which will be relevant to the particular task and populate that, as simple as that. Once you populate that, let the data scientist rock, as simple as that. And again, if there is a latest buzzword called IoT, everything needs IoT on the place. So what we can do, even if you want to introduce IoT here, all you need is another client which will, which will listen to the event. Whenever any high calorie food got ordered, they will send a notification. So Apple smartwatch will get a notification that you are ordering a high calorie food, as simple as that. So, this is the scalability that we are getting out of here. And the way that we can scale is totally depends on the business requirements. That is most, most important thing here. There is an another important aspect in this way of designing things is the data is unidirectional. Have you seen that? There is no crisscross, you know, tangling of uh, data flow here. It's, everything is uniform. Like whenever a user is going to push something, he is going to click something here and it is going directly to the comment side of our application. And again, it means you no know, sequential. And this particular uh, way of thinking has influenced uh, uh, Redux, Flex. We call it as unidirectional data flow, which is the concept which derived out of this kind of design. 
Cool. So how the read model projection work? Now we got received a event. There it is again similar to the imparity stuff. Like there will be a similar document, but after instead of receiving a command, we are in receiving an event and populating the field which are relevant to this one. Okay, let me introduce error handling. So uh, in a object oriented way, like whenever we introduce error handling, our code will get tangled, like full of try catch, if else, all the things will come into the picture and uh, makes our job very harder. But in functional way of thinking, all we need is a type. That's uh, yesterday, uh, Debasish has a good talk around, you no know, modeling things using algebraic data types. That's what here. Like, we are going to come out with a new type called result, which is a nothing but a choice type. Whenever you do any operation, it's going to be either success or it's going to be an error. In case of success, you will get the, the result of the outcome, the operation of the outcome. Uh, in case of error, it is, you are going to contain what is the error details. That is what this T and E is all about. They're nothing but generics. So let me introduce error handling to the existing function. Okay, let me take one use case, because I cannot go through all the error cases here, so i just taken one example, which can be easily you know, extended to the other side. Um, the command open tab should applicable only when the state is in closed tab. If the state is in different state, like maybe the order is in progress or uh, you know it is being served in different state, that means this command is uh, irrelevant. That means there is a, we need to handle it in our case. So what we do, we, I'm just doing a pattern matching here. Um, if the command is open tab and the state is closed tab, it is a success. If it is not, this, this is a while character which match all other state and it says the tab has been already opened. So the change here is earlier we were returning event list. Now it is a result of event list or a string. It means it can be either success or a error. In case of error, it will be having an error message. We can extend this same concept in other functions, like evolve functions instead of returning an event result, it will be result returning a result of event list and return result of string. So now we have come to the end where we are going, we are exposing this as an API, right? So there it is very simple. We are going to do a pattern matching. We are going to call the command, handle command function. If it returns success, we are going to say return okay response and save the, all the events. In case of error, we are going to return a bad request with a message. You see here we are applying the functional thing throughout the end. The only impurity is happening in the database side as well as the fetching side. So we can likewise we can extend like other uh, uh, you know functionalities like fetching events may fail. You can model the same way. Sorry. So we can model the same thing in other functionality like fetching events may fail, serving events may fail. And there was a very interesting blog article called railway oriented programming in, you can find that in f shop for fun and profit dot com which it talks more in detail about error handling okay uh, often i get this question when i talk about event sourcing okay the concept that i'm showing you know, you know, you know demonstrating here is the real system that i built in my one of my projects so uh, often people come to me and ask this question like see everything is fine but in order to compute states i need to go and fetch all the events and it may cause the performance issue? The answer is yes and no. It depends on how you design your, what is the root of your events? What is the common aggregate you are using to generate the events? See, if you design it correctly, uh, typically you will be getting some five to 20, or in the, in the range of 10s, 20s, something like that. But in case, if you still had problems, like in the model, the domain that you are working on cannot coming out with a, better design and you need to store all the events, there is a concept called snapshots. Snapshot by Snapshots is kind of similar to git rebase. You can go back and quash all the history and you can start from somewhere else. So let's assume that with the bank analogy that I told earlier. Say assume that uh, tomorrow you are getting a mail from uh, a particular bank, it says that, uh, that like we will be giving only past six months statement. If you are asking for before past six months, there is no answer from our end. So in that case, the typical backend of uh, the bank application will be 
they will be maintaining only six months transaction data. Like if you ask for more than that, like they will they will be having an initial balance in the before sixth month. Say for example, at the end of sixth month, your account balance is hundred dollar. From here on, your initial state is hundred dollar, not zero dollar. So likewise, you can create snapshots that again applicable to the business context that you are working on. You can create snapshots so that you do not need to fetch all the events to recreate the state. And uh, this particular solution is not uh, by designing in this way by any chance uh, like it, it does not going to solve your concurrency issues. The concurrency issue is still here. That means say for example at any point of time you can receive two different events at the same instance of time. So how do you you know prioritize which event to process and which to leave? That's where we are going back to the again the, the traditional technique of row version in optimistic locking. So we typically whenever the update any row, we update the row version. So likewise we can do, for all the events we can put version to it. That will be incremental nature so that if, if, if you receive an order, you know, event which is not in the order, we just ignore it saying that the data has been updated, this event is no longer relevant to the system. When, okay, everything is cool. Now you are all set to use this in your real time application. But you need to consider certain things before going ahead with this particular design. This is not a silver bullet. Okay, it, it solves a set of problems which is associated with wherever you need tracking of what are the events happened in the system, transactions, and all those security aspects. It is a very good solution. But if you are working on a CRUD based application, this is an overkill. You don't need to get user change the password, uh, you know, user edited his email. Those information and all, if that, those events are relevant to the problem that you are working on, you can use this event sourcing. But in case, if those things you are not at all going to use, better go ahead with the traditional CRUD-based design that we are having, okay? And uh, the most important thing is this CQRS and event sourcing are not top-level architecture. So designing an entire system based on this way of thing is a anti-pattern. So you need to think of a slice in your entire problem domain, and for that particular slice, use this particular way of design. And finally, um, the last part of the talk is around F-sharp, because we implemented this everything with F-sharp. So let's showcase some sort of F-sharp code, which I personally love. Um, before I get started with the off-scale F-sharp, I just want to quote some of the testimonials around F-sharp. Okay, a uh, lot of thought talks are here, sir. I just picked this thought talks from TechCrad 2012. They mentioned that F-sharp is very great in expressing, you know, the business and domain logic. You are going to see the code and you will find that out. And one of the most interesting testimonial is this one. I have just delivered three business critical projects in F-sharp. I'm still waiting for the first bus. It is the same case for myself. I, my, the application that I wrote, it's in production for the last seven months. I'm also waiting for the first production bus. And uh, another good testimonial is Jet.com, which is a e-commerce startup in US. Recently, it got acquired by uh, Walmart for $3 billion. Their entire tech stack is around F-sharp. So it's in production. You can find a lot of testimonials in the website. Okay, let me show some of the awesomeness of F-sharp. The first awesomeness is I'm not using Visual Studio. I'm using something called Visual Studio Code. But again, I can use Autumn Editor, but not, that's not a difference. The difference is there is an extension called Ionide, which is driven by the F-Shop community that provide all intelligence, typical ID that required for developing your application. So let me start with the domain. So uh, I'm just defining something called tab, which models the state, item, food, drink, all two liners, three liners. There is no public class, getter, setter, all those noise is not there. I'm just defining the domain here. And once I define the domain, if you see here, you are getting something called 
I'm not, these things, the signature of a function is actually coming from the Ionoid plugin that I talked about, which is one of the cool thing that uh, come into the F-sharp community in recent days. You know, uh, you just define a function, the signature will automatically pop as a code length feature. So you can, so in a typical functional programming, uh, you know, whenever we do any sort of application, we are more interested in the signature of a function that is been there. So I defined all the things. Let me show the events. We, we told different events, right? All the events can be modeled using something called a discriminated union. Again, it's a choice data type. A event can be either tab open, order placed, drink served, whatever we saw in that diagram has been equivalent in the code, which is very, very shorter line. And uh, the equivalent commands is in the present tense. Like command, if it is the open tab, uh, in the events it will be tab open. If it is a place order command, event is order place. This present tense, past tense pair will be there. Cool. And um, let me show you an another awesomeness where F sharp is really shining. Okay, let me take this behavior. When you serve a food, it has to undergo this kind of validation. Like the, 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 the food that you are serving has to, be play, has to be part of the order in the first place. Then it should be prepared, otherwise you cannot serve the food. And you should not serve the served food again. And the final thing is sometimes if, the, if that is the last item, that means the order has been closed. So if we model all these things in, a, in a, the same way that we do uh, typical object oriented, we end up with this kind of nested if else. So how can we resolve this? This is very bad code, right? So do, nobody wants to write this kind of code or nobody wants to read or work in this kind of code. So how can we refactor this particular thing from a functional perspective? In the morning talk, we had the clue. Write a function. Write a function that models this if condition. How can we write a function? So what I did, I created a set of functions. This is, I, th th those uh, you know, fancy brackets and I'll just leave that, that is part of the syntax in f -shop. So what I did, I created functions which do only one thing. If it is a non-ordered, just do check the first function, non-ordered food, will check whether the food is ordered or not. Likewise, unprepared food, served food completes IU order, already served food, all the things, I write it as a separate, separate function. Now anybody can check this validity of this function. Now what I need to do, I can just use the pattern matching out here. See, if the food is non-ordered food, throw an error, say cannot serve the non-ordered food. If the food is already served food, cannot serve the already served food. See, the code is very, very, very readable. There is no if else, and uh, the beauty of here is, Anybody can, the, even the business analyst can read this code and say, hey, you are missing this case. And even if you are missing some case, you will get, no, no, okay, what will happen when this particular state happens? So you are getting more intuitiveness to the, the domain that you are working on, which is very, very powerful. That's why TechRadar, Tartok has mentioned that f -sharp is very good at expressing the business domain. So, um, cool. so we got 10 more minutes, so I can show a little more awesomeness. Um, In the morning uh, talk, uh, who were there in uh, Ankit F shop in production? Okay, cool. So he talks about type providers, how it helped in uh, solving the clear text problem. And uh, that type providers is a generic concept. We can take it and applicably in, uh, in not only in when, when we are fetching the data, we can apply it in other scenarios also. One of the scenario is, uh, which I find it very helpful for me, is. So the commands, right, whatever we have saw in the uh, slides, it's nothing but the JSON request coming from the user. So th this is the command, JSON request coming from the user to close the tab. There he is mentioning what is the tab ID and what is the amount. This is the JSON format that we are expecting from the front end. And what I do, I just do a, again, I'm, I'm using a type address, I'm just parsing this payload 
and I'm converting that to a equivalent type which will contain tab ID and amount. The beauty of this type providers is, let us assume that you are coming out with a new schema for your JSON. Say instead of amount, you are putting something called price. See, I'm getting a compiler error. There is no price. So if I rename that to price, and you can see that I'm getting the intelligence also. Even if I change the price to amount, again I will get a compiler error. So I can change that to amount. This is a concept called type providers which is there in FSHOP. And uh, FSHOP has a lot of cool libraries. And one of the libraries, one of my personal favorite, is a library called Suave. Yep. Yeah. So uh, the library that I mentioned is Suave, which will help you to do web applications in F Sharp. So the, the beauty of Suave is the way the API it provides to develop, you know, to develop a web application. Uh, I show you a end, HTTP endpoint which deals with the queries. If you see, everything is readable. If it is a get request, I'm going to choose all these get requests, slash table, slash table, to do's dot chef, to do's dot spider. And this pipeline is the a monadic operator that we don't want to get into that. So the, basically what we are getting is a lightweight, without no ceremonies, there is no controller, there is, no, there is nothing. Like we just create a function. The first function matches this particular path. If, the, if this function matches, then this particular handler is getting called. So without you know putting a lot of mental load to your brain, you just simply write by following the syntactic sugar which is being offered by the language as well as by the libraries. And uh, the next another library which is available in F-Shop is Packet. So how many of you love the new uh, yawn coming into the JavaScript world, the alternative for NPM? Have you yawn? And another package managed. Yeah, Facebook Google combination. The what Yon does to NPM is what exactly Packet has done to New uh, NuGet. Yeah, it's it's on top of this, but it yeah, it's it's going to solve certain problems like uh, dependency management, all those things. Exactly, that's the same thing Packet is also doing. Packet is already .NET environment has a package manager called NuGet. So instead of replacing that Packet, adding what on adding it to NPM, it just add, make it very simpler so that like these are my entire dependencies, my entire of my entire application. And uh, if I want to know what is, uh, say for example, uh, I'm using a library, you know, a library project called Persistence. What is the dependency of this particular library? I can just go and do packet references, and I can find any event store is the only dependency. I can, you, we can, I can query the same thing in my command prompt also. So whenever I want to do what are my dependencies and all this thing, this packet management you know, saves the day. And uh, another awesome thing around uh, F-Shop is a build library called Fake. It's very similar to Rake in uh, Rake, Make, it's Fake in F-Shop, okay? Uh, <laughs> so what I, you can write your build script in F-Shop. Since F-Shop and C-Shop can interrupt together, for your existing C-Shop projects, you can use F-Shop and write the build script. So that's much easier. And uh, I, I am I, like, is anybody here worked on MS build XML files? OK. I don't know going to give you any comments. Just see what I did here. This is cleaning. I'm just mentioning this clean these directories, build up, build these, these projects under release mode and output the log to this particular place, build the test, run the test, 
and I can integrate with my NPM local task. I'm just creating a new target called client where I'm calling NPM to do the NPM install, NPM build. And all I need to do to define the order, I just need to use this DSL. This is my build order. And I can mention what is the run, tar run target or default. It is by de if I didn't specify any target when I'm running this script, it will take client by default, or I can specify all the scripts out here. So writing a build script in a language which is type safe, all the, now you can do function programming in your build script. That's the beauty of this particular library. And uh, a lot of people talking about uh, containers, dockers, and all those things. With the help of Mono, you can, I, this is a Docker file, where I'm using Mono to run this uh, F-sharp application. You can put that into a container and you can scale horizontally or vertically, whatever you want to do. Or uh, like later, recently, Microsoft came out with .NET Core. So if this particular project can be ported to .NET Core also. Again, it will be run inside a Docker container. So, and um, this Ionite plugin, Visual Studio Code. I just want to say, uh, a lot of people have a feeling that, you know, uh, it is an, it another Microsoft product, uh, all the things commercial and all those things will, is it, is it an open source? Uh, like, I just, in the morning I had a discussion with one of the person out here, I was talking about, when you say Xerox, now everybody talking about uh, taking a printout, or is it, taking the photocopy. The word photocopy has been totally, you know, overshadowed by the word Xerox, but Xerox is not the actual photocopier. Like it's just a you know company which come out with the concept very first time, but now the concept itself has been rebranded as the the company name. Likewise, uh, everybody has their own uh, assumptions around the Microsoft stuff and all these things. But let me clear out one thing: that F Sharp is being totally driven by the community. And if you don't like something in F Sharp, F Sharp compiler code out there in GitHub, go change it, write a pull request. If it's really making sense it will get updated at no time. That's the guarantee that I can give. Because recently, uh, Elm has a very good support for compiler errors. You can get a lot of good quality compiler errors. One person in the F-Sharp community uh, saw this particular thing, which we find it really useful. But we, he compared with the F-Sharp compiler, it was uh, showing some bad error messages. What he did is just write a pull, created a pull request. Now, in the latest F-Sharp version, the compiler is more like beautiful and elegant in the way that Elm shows the error. So it's been totally driven by the community. So if you are thinking of uh, trying out a functional programming language, F# -sharp is uh, one of the best out there in the market. I I, I won't say that it is uh, the language; it is one of the best. And uh, from my perspective, I have been working with F# -sharp for almost four years now. Uh, personally, I found uh, I get the same productivity which I when I work with Python, and it has the type safety from Haskell is being inherited. It is again F# -sharp is from ML family, so. 80% of the type play that we do with Haskell, can we can apply that in Haskell also, sorry, in F# -sharp also. And uh, it's fun to play with F# -sharp. So uh, that's it about F# -sharp. I just, the, the last slide of my presentation is this. I have written a book called F# -sharp Applied, which is to demystify the concept around uh, functional programming. A lot of people think functional programming is around uh, you know, academic stuff, we cannot do something, I know, do a full-fledged solution. There is a lot of misconception is there in the market. So this, uh, I, I wrote this and self-published this book recently. And this particular book where I talks about, uh, it's a practical guide of doing web development in F-Sharp. And I use the library which I mentioned uh, in the slides, like Suau. And uh, the complete, the code that I shared here is available in my GitHub repo. And if you like uh, F-Sharp, the community is available there in fsharp.org. You can go and check out all the great things happening in the F-Sharp ecosystem, and you can be a member and can start contributing to the F-Sharp site. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, sure. using the snapshot approach, right? Can you just uh, tell a few cases where you you think, like you talked about scaling it, right? And making it distributed. So can you just elaborate on that, how it will okay. come? 
snapshot is something like uh, typically when you when you when you do rebase in git <laughs> okay, fine. So basically, uh, uh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, fine. So snapshot is uh, you, you you just go ahead with the first initial implementation. You don't need to apply snapshot in the very first place. And like otherwise, it will be called as premature optimization. We don't want to get into that in depth. So you let's start with the first thing. When you feel that this particular you know fetching the, the events are growing like anything. You need to ask yourself two questions: whether the, the aggregate of the event, like under which, you know, category these all these events are coming in, is it is it modeled correctly? If that is modeled correctly, you won't get set of events. Say for example, uh, uh, if you are modeling an yeah, account, so your transaction, your all the transaction will be a log under this thing. One way of creating a snapshot will be, you can create a snapshot per month. And uh, you know, say account slash colon account ID colon this month, this year. So you can do optimization at this level and you can create snapshots and whenever you want, when you are creating a snapshot, when you are fetching the events, you need to check whether the snapshot is available or not. If it is available, you need to do fetch that and do the changes out of it. So uh, there are, uh, there are, Mm. There is the live uh, database. There, there are two databases right now in the market which caters the event sourcing. One is uh, Event Store, uh, which is a uh, uh, open source as well as commercial support is available. And then is another uh, t uh, database called Datomic, which is also a, the database itself is based on this event sourcing and CQRS. So we can leverage those two libraries. And the, in uh, .NET, we have this library called the N Event Store. Which is a which it is an abstraction on top of any database system. So we, by using this library, I can point to any database to get this event streaming and the snapshot and everything. Uh, isn't this similar to modifying state? Like, uh, let's say we have one event and uh, we take a uh, snapshot and uh, we overwrite it. And uh, again, we have one event, and we, uh, again we overwrite it. So, isn't it like modifying some state, like having a global variable and uh, modifying the state? Is, is it is is it similar? Uh, I mean, modifying state and uh, taking a snapshot. Okay. So, uh, uh, I, I, there is something called the in the Git where we use something called direct cyclic graph or something bag we say. So, everything is an immutable thing. So by likewise, in the event store also, every event is immutable. Say, uh, for example, you just think of a uh, set of list. If you are creating a snapshot, what you do? You compute everything and create and put that into a new place. And from you are, when the new event comes, you will be starting from where you computed and aggregated and stored. Like you won't modify the existing events. Whatever you, you persisted as the events will be always be there as immutable. So you can always go back and transact and do the, apply the transaction and come back. So we are not mutating the state here. We are computing the new state and putting that into a new place. Uh, SWAV. The web library is a SWAV. Okay. So you showed us where you refactored it into a maybe type, the option type in a step. Sorry, I couldn't get you. You had an if else condition, right? Ah, 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 ah. So you refactored into the option type, right? Uh, yeah, it, not on option type, uh, as a function. I refactored that if as a function. Yeah, option yeah, type, op option, yeah, uh, option right. type, yeah. So, so the question is, is there anything like Monad? I, I heard there are computation expressions that could easily solve this. Yeah, we can write another computation expression uh, to solve the same problem. Okay, monadic is another way of thing, you know, solving the same problem. Here, uh, it's a very simple thing that I come out with. So F one of the great thing about F sharp is they, they, they won't use any term of the functors, applicative, and all those things. <laughs> yes. So, but like you can, th this construct is solves one like this the same problem. This can be solved with computation expression also. But I didn't use here, but it can be solved in that way also. Basic objective is. Hide the ugly code, make it more readable and maintainable. Yes. Uh, 
I have just uh, one point when you were talking about CQRS uh, caveats or some concerns you mentioned performance. And Sorry? The CQRS uh, caveats or the concerns. Yeah, yeah, things to consider. Yeah, things to consider. I think one other um, thing also is the, the CQRS will always give eventual consistency guarantee. Yes, yes. So that also is one thing to, yes, uh, to keep correct. in mind. happens if your uh, application updates, like if it's evolving, you have new events coming in, new types of actions happening, or some types of events are no longer valid? Okay, that's a very good question. <laughs> that is the thing that we need to look for when we are driving events. So when a new event comes, uh, that means the new field is get added to the event. Uh, for your past events will not contain this entry. And there is no migration, database migration, like what we do in events, so because everything is immutable, you cannot go back and change the history. So what we do, that's where your application code will become, uh, that you need to handle that in your application. Say for example, uh, in the, say, uh, the, in the bank synology, like uh, when you are doing third party transfer, earlier we are not tracking from whom this, the money is coming from. That's, this is how the bank works so far. After some time they decided it is a security flaw, though, so they added, this event say, um, the, the, all the third party transfer event should contain the, uh, the other party. So in this case, now your domain, when you receive a, even when you are processing an event, now you need to consider two things. The third party date in the third, all the third party transaction, the sender may be there or may, they may not be there. You need to include this particular logic in your application code. Sorry? So like if, some specific feature or some event is no longer applicable, but you need to keep it around throughout your application's history, right? Because it's yes, like uh, there are there are uh, there are n number of ways to solve this problem. One is what I mentioned, your application code. It's, it's a similar to what we do in versioning, like back, we provide backward compatibility, add different versions. See, even event also we can add versions to it, and uh, probably if this is uh, this version handle this kind of things. So it's the typical uh, API versioning, database versioning, that's the same thing here. But only thing is, we won't do database migration, something like, we, we won't go back and change history. When it happened, it happened. If you are not capturing something, that's the design flaw. <laughs> here we don't need to do migration in the first place. Because everything is just a transaction log. We are just appending. Yeah, data mix, data mix has, all this concept has been embedded into the database itself. So it solved the problem in a way. Sure. Okay, uh, it seems that there is a timeout. Like, uh, I will be there out. So if you have any questions, feel free to contact me and I can, I'm very happy to help you. Thank you.